So, Helen, um, two years ago, you began a journey to becoming a self-managing team. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what prompted that decision? What inspired you to, to start that journey? Yes, it was, as you say, about, about two years ago. I just finished a course called the um, Alt MBA, the Alternative MBA that Seth Godin designed um, and that had been incredibly inspiring and I'd met lots of new people on that and one of the people that I met um, is a woman called Susan Basterfield and we clicked straight away we share um, a passion for working out loud and we started connecting over zoom once a fortnight after the course and as it got towards Christmas and I knew that Susan was a, a really big reader like me I asked her to recommend a few books um, for me to read over the holiday season and she recommended did three and one of them was reinventing organizations by Frederick Ballou and as I read it I I say to the team I started to shake it was one of those um, moments where you're reading something and somebody can articulate the, the thoughts and feelings that you had but not being able to organize or frame in the way that, that he did so I was utterly inspired and enthralled about the concept of team and the whole evolution of organizations and could recognize that as a team we were operating in, in the green space as a sort of family culture um, and I, I wanted a smooth teal but I knew obviously that couldn't be just my decision and um, so before I'd even finished the book I was starting to talk to the team about it on slack I was asking who'd like to read it along with me I sent copies of the book to the team members who wanted to do that and for team members who were interested but didn't really want to get into a book at that stage I found clips of, of YouTube and, and different things that ex explained the same concept our next full team meeting, so we have whole days together, was in March. So, so from February to March, I asked people to read it. We had conversations about what we thought it might mean to us. Um, and on that team day in March, we looked at whether there was a cultural alignment between Teal and how we were operating, what some of the practicalities might mean. And we then that day made the decision that we were going to go on on that journey. So it started um, back then. That was right at the beginning. I, I've heard you say before that you were a little bit almost smug about, well, how hard can it be to become a self-managing team? Um, what what was the, what were the starting points and what were some of the milestones along the journey? Um, that's such an awful thing for me to say, but um, I did. So I, I read read the book and thought, okay, there are three elements to to being a teal organisation. Certainly, how Lalu describes it, it would be bring the whole person to work, evolutionary purpose, um, and self management. Now. I think we were already a great team. A lot of our work had been working in person-centered ways, thinking about person-centered teams. So I kind of thought in my head, well, this is this is like being a person-centered team, but just going a bit further. We already brought the whole person to work. We all had one-page profiles that describe what people appreciate about us, what matters to us, and how best to support us. We have team agreements about how we work together as a team. Um, we know each other personally um, very well. We pay a lot of attention to homework balance. So, so the whole person to work, I think we got that. The um, the why stuff, our purpose, well, we've all watched Simon Sinek's um, uh, Start With Why. We have a really clear purpose. I, I thought that was already nailed. So really, you know, how hard could this self-management stuff be? But it meant me giving up my role and power as CEO. And it meant that we needed to step up to each other and step up to accountability into a completely different way. And what I learned was we were more interested in being polite and lovely to each other and getting on well than we were about holding each other to account. So that was a really big, big learning curve for us. So we, we started by um, looking at our accountability. So, so being really clear in a Google document about our different roles and what we could hold each other to account for. And we introduced tactical meetings. So Five of us were, were particularly excited about digging deeper into this, and we started a journey of becoming holacracy practitioners. And I asked Susan Basterfield, who is a holacracy practitioner, to support us to go through that process. So we had every two weeks, um, the five of us would have an hour Zoom call with Susan. We do homework in between, and we got to a stage where we were um, competent 
got signed off. Um, you have to do an online test, which is really, really hard. It was like doing an A-level again uh, with a very high um, pass rate, uh, pass test that you had to do as well. So five of us did that. So we were confident enough in using governance um, as a process within HSA and using the tactical meetings. And we started to introduce weekly tactical meetings. And they are such a different style of meeting. So again, we've done a lot of work on meetings and making them really positive and productive. But the whole thing in tactical meetings of raising tensions and the way of addressing them it felt brutal um, at the beginning. So asking people what they need and, and, and figuring that out. So it, it was a bit like folding your arms the wrong way all the time. It felt awkward and, and a bit strange. And it took quite a bit of getting used to. Um, we've just finished a team meeting today and uh, I've been talking about this and it is simply the way that we work now. It feels normal and ordinary and easy. But at the beginning, that was really um, a big jolt for us, like stepping up to be accountable to each other and um, giving each other feedback in a different way and, you know, being prepared to say to each other, we've committed to this and, and this isn't happening and, and how are we going to figure this out? Was there, were there any other things you did to help with giving feedback to each other in different ways or how else did you evolve from that? culture of being polite to a culture of, of being honest and straight with each other? We'd already done some work on the best ways to give each other feedback and that again came from the Alt MBA because the whole process of the Alt MBA is that you are giving um, the other people in your groups feedback on their work three times a week to five people. So after I'd finished the course I had this awful realisation that I'd given strangers on this course that I've been doing, um, it's a, an online course, so you do it as well as working full time. But I've been giving this group of strangers more feedback than I've given my team in a year. And that was awful and shocking to me. Um, so the team and I did some work about looking at why we found it difficult to give each other feedback. And one of the potential reasons is we didn't know how each person preferred their feedback. So we did an exercise together where we looked at, you know, what are the best ways to give each other feedback and the best times and things like that. And I know if you Google best ways to give people feedback, there's a standard way of doing it. But um, on the basis of being person centered, you can't assume the same for everybody. So I wanted to learn more about the nuances of that. But actually, um, I read another book that was almost as, as powerful as Frederick Lelou's book, which is called An Everyone Culture. And it talks about being deliberately developmental organisations. And that was the first time that I read about immunity to change maps. And I invited another member of our team, Emily, to help me do my immunity change map. And that meant asking members of the team about if I could change anything about myself what would be the biggest thing that could make the most positive difference to them um, for me to change? And, and I got a greater sense of awareness that actually I was finding it difficult to give people feedback and that wasn't encouraging other people to give me feedback and I was struggling to model it and what was underneath that. So, so that was a really quite powerful thing um, to do. And some of it was that I w was worried that I couldn't give it very well and that sometimes I may come across more abruptly than I want to. And I didn't want to damage relationships by giving feedback badly. So I was so much part of the problem. Um, and I had to start changing my behavior and be bolder about giving people feedback and ask for forgiveness when I did that in a way that, that might have been more brusque than I'd like it to. So I think the biggest lesson for me is I had to change how I was working, if I was serious about us stepping up and being more accountable to each other. And the other thing was, we had, we have good adult, adult to relationships, but sometimes we'd slip into parent child with me being the parent and me being mom. And I had to get much better at spotting when that was happening and, and call it out and recognize it. And I had to keep saying to people, actually, that's not my decision. I'm not the CEO anymore. How can you take that forward without without me 
you know, me being involved in it. And we even developed um, uh, on Slack, you can have different symbols. So so there's a swirl in green, so tealy green color. And I'd, I'd use that on Slack to indicate when, when actually this is a different way of me being behaving uh, as not the CEO anymore. If I'm really honest, Lisa, I think I stepped back too much. I think I got confused by what not being a CEO anymore and still being to, being able to operate as a leader. And I think a self-managed team calls us all to step into leadership roles. And I think I stepped back a bit too far. I'm, I'm better at that now. But, but a lot of it was me learning to behave differently and me being more aware about my behavior. And when I was stepping into a mum role or stepping back too far or being shy about giving people feedback myself. That's fascinating. I think the two things that, that I'm hearing there is the first was that you took a real um, risk uh, wanting to model a feedback culture by inviting feedback from, from everyone as a kind of starting point um, so that you could then also start giving it more. Uh, and then the second thing about embracing or or finding what leadership looks like in a self-managing team and finding the balance between stepping back but not abdicating. Uh, I think you, you've captured that that beautifully. How do you, how do you and how did I step back from my formal role as CEO but still show up as a leader? And I think that was a tension that I struggled with in the beginning and I'm getting better at now. Uh, the other really big difference was the transparency of information. So now every team member um, on a monthly basis has exactly the same financial information that I as CEO had and still have um, so that everybody knows how much money is in the bank, how much money we're owed, how many days everybody did. We all know what each other earn, you know, on a monthly basis. So, so I think the transparency of information was also a really big shift. And part of not being mum is me not being the only person who worried about money all the time and the only person who knew what was in our bank balance. And I, I'm, I'm sure that the team isn't lying awake worrying about money, but it does feel completely different when we all know when our bank balance, uh, the organisation's bank balance is healthier than, than at other times. Um, so that was the other critical thing that we we we're clearer about accountability and what we could hold each other to account for. We changed the ways that we met together um, so that we could address tensions and, and demonstrate our feedback in, in practice in a really different way. And we have complete transparency of information um, and know how we can make decisions about money in a different way too. The transparency about money thing is something that I know people often really struggle with when transitioning to a self-managing organisation. How did you do that? Was it, did you do it all in one go? Did you do it little by little? Did you discuss, like, what was the process of doing that? Well, we, the issue about who earns what was always very clear because we have a, a sort of flat structure with a day rate and, and the amount that you earn is dependent on how many days you, you do. So that, that, was, that wasn't a big deal at all. And we were already sharing how many days people did. Um, but what was different was, was sharing this is what is in our bank and this is what we're owed um, and, and that, that kind of information. So that we just did it from the first month and, and sent it out to everybody. What, what we found difficult was using the advice process. So I, I must say, as a process that hasn't really worked for us, um, we still use it now, but only for financial decision making. And we had a governance meeting today to, to agree something. So the other thing that we, the two things that we haven't done that a lot of other people transitioning to self-manage have management have done is we're not using the advice process except for money and we are not we didn't adopt the holacracy constitution and the reason that we didn't adopt the holacracy constitution although the other key things in holacracy we are doing was because it's so hard to read and understand and it's so hard to read and understand they even have 
uh, an easy read version of it. And I, I just think that's completely at odds with a self-management approach. And I have had this conversation with the people who were then in the UK, with the people who, who introduced me to Holacracy and I did their introductory session. So we, so rather than taking somebody else's constitution, we are essentially growing our constitution through governance. So we're growing together what our policies, procedures, way of operating together are um, um, organically. And that feels much, much more comfortable. And it felt a bit like the purpose of the Vlocity Constitution was to hold the CEO to account in um, not taking up the, the power of the CEO again. But because that was me, that didn't feel like a big deal. So it, it, I can completely understand why that might be for other organisations, but but that, that wasn't an issue because I was so utterly committed to doing this. So at the beginning, it was decisions about money that people um, found difficult to do. And I think it's because it coincided with you know, quite a difficult financial period in the context of health and social care, and therefore in the context of our income as an organisation, that we're all a bit too scared to spend money because we knew money was really scarce. So, so we made um, um, some decisions to say, look, here's a, a level of, inf uh, of of spending that everybody can do without getting permission from anybody else. But if it's a bit higher than that, um, come back and, and ask. Um, but people were still nervous about doing it. So, so we looked at why that was and decided that we'd have um, a committee of three or a team of three of us who would um, uh, agree or, or, or not um, on spend. And that was me because I have the longest history of managing money in the organisation, not because I was CEO. Another team member, Rob, who used to be an accountant. And then the third um, team member changed on a rotating basis. So everybody got the opportunity to be part of that group. And what we agreed was if somebody posted a request for money, it was almost like having to do it as a mini business case. It wasn't just that like, I want this money. But if we invest this money here, here are the consequences of this and the benefits. And here's why I think it's, it's good for our financial future rather than just can I spend this on this. And then the three of us would have three or four days to get in touch with each other, make a decision and then give that decision back to the person who'd asked for money. And that's working better um, for us. So, so we've had to tweak and think differently about how we make decisions about money and how we use the advice process. But I think at the moment we're finding that our accountability structure is robust enough that we don't... Um, um, if we want to ask advice from other people, we would tend to use the, the tactical meeting for that. I wanted to talk about um, how it's been for you moving from CEO to a member, albeit a, a leader, um, but a member of a self-managed team. If you were talking to a fellow CEO, um, what advice would you share with them or what insights would you share with them in terms of what they have to give up um, and also what you sort of get back? What a great question. So I do a regular podcast with um, Susan Basterfield, who's supporting a, a really large organisation, Avivo, in um, Australia to make this transition. And I'm also in conversation with um, Adele Harrison, who's doing the same in local Cornerstone, Cornerstone in, in Scotland. Um, so two other women who have made and are making the transition from CEO to self-management as well. And I, I think the, the biggest challenge for me is, is the one that we've just spoken about, which is how do you give up your formal power, support everybody else to manage that as well as you managing it, but not give up your moral leadership and um, the, the sort of showing up as, as a leader. So that's been the tension that I grappled with. And as I said, I, I stepped back a bit too far. And, and it may be that that is necessary to help people understand and, and comprehend a different role. So an example would be is if you're in a meeting um, that you're usually chairing, you know, making sure that there's other people taking responsibility for chairing and, and doing other things, but you still making contributions, but not everything being deferred to you all the time. So it is about when that's happening, recognizing it and calling it out really and saying, no, I, I'm not CEO anymore. And that means that that isn't my decision anymore. And that decision is held over here. And how can I support you to, you know, go over there to to enable that decision to be made without it feel like a massive abdication and without it feeling like there's suddenly a leadership void. So I think I think that's the, the tension 
and a constant vigilance is required. And I did slip a couple of times. And, and, and when you do that, say, OK, guess I've just spotted myself behaving like a CEO again. So, so let me give you an example. Um, at one of the tactical meetings that I have, so Adam is our fantastic um, comms and marketing person. And it, it doesn't he doesn't take part in our tactical meetings because it, to be honest, in some ways we just haven't thought about it because he lives in a different country, in a different time zone. And that just wasn't on our radar. And it suddenly became really obvious to me in a couple of conversations with Adam that it would utterly make sense for him to be there. So I said to him in a private communication, oh, Adam, please, will you come and join us in our tactical meetings? Then we'll be able to nail some of these issues that, that you know, we keep coming up as, as difficult. So I invited him and I said, our next tactical meeting is at, say, one o'clock on Friday. And then I realized what I'd done. So so two days later, when I spotted this, I said, Adam, it's, it's not my decision to invite you to tactical meeting. So what I'm going to do is at the next tactical meeting, I'll raise that as an issue, um, propose it to the team, see what they think. And if they're in agreement, you know, you'll be invited to attend the next tactical meeting. So I then chose to say to team members, I acted as a CAO again, and I shouldn't have. This is what I, done, I did. Um, that's not my decision, so I'm bringing it to you now. Um, what do you think? So, so, so it's still so easy to, to, you know, I've been doing this for 18 years with HSA. So, so this is some habits that are, are, are quite hard to break. So it's the personal vigilance to say, you know, I'm not CEO anymore. That's acting like a CEO. Recognize that you've done that. Ask for forgiveness if, if that's what's re- required, if, it, if that impacts on, on other people and carry on in the same way that when people email me and say, will you just check this, Helen? Say, actually, that's, that's not my role anymore um, because they can't change their behavior unless I'm changing mine. And I think if I'm really honest and if, if some of my team members were stood with me here, they'd say, do you know what? You were a bit blunt with that at the beginning, Helen, and I, and I hold my hands up um, around that as well. Um, it, it was it was hard. I still occasionally slip into that. I hold up my hands up when, I, when I've got that wrong. I really love the I, the idea of it's almost like working out loud and well, making mistakes out loud um, and sharing those and and asking for forgiveness and I think that's I think that's really helpful in the transition period of of just marking out like oh okay I slipped a bit there let's share that though and learn from it and and make that sort of learning journey visible and then it invites invites everyone else to do the same as well. That's exactly what, what I was, was trying to do. Um, and I was talking to a colleague of mine who um, who is a, a commissioner who was, was saying, you know, one of these organisations that has moved towards self-management, he was speaking to a manager who'd left and the manager left because he thought there was a leadership vacuum. And actually, one of our team did the same. In fact, I think probably two of our, our colleagues who left um, after we'd um, been exploring self-management I think I think if you were asking them them directly and they were able to be honest with themselves they would say we came into this team because we wanted Helen's leadership um, and we wanted to work with her and when she stepped back and, and the invitation for us for us to be self-managing that wasn't the psychological contract that I'd come into this team for and that wasn't what I wanted anymore um, and eventually I, I need to, to, to leave because that wasn't what I'd signed up for. Before, I was everybody's safety net. And now we are each other's safety net. But that takes more emotional labour to, to create that safety net and hold it together ourselves than just one person doing it in a formal role. So you've got to be up for that um, and recognise that that's, that's different. And I think any organisation that's already established, that's choosing to move to self-management, um, it, it is recognising that. And that's why, so we're in the process of setting up some wellbeing teams and you can never cheapy people across from an existing organisation into wellbeing teams. People have to voluntarily choose to come into this role, I think. And it has to thread right through it, recruitment. So we're recruiting at the moment and, and everything that we're doing has to say two things. We're looking for people who can deliver compassionate care and we're looking for people up for self-management who want to take responsibility for their own work and working together seriously. And you can't have one without the other if you're going to be part of a wellbeing team. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. I know a self-managing organisation who 
the employees wrote a scaring them away letter, they called it, which was a letter that they would give to candidates interviewing for a role, kind of saying, you know, you have to do things yourself around here. You can't wait for someone else to do it for you. Things might be a bit messy or not as um, complete or uh you know, formalised as, as other organisations at you know, various different points because they found that uh, you are looking for a very particular kind of indi individual who's up for that um, and it's challenging and, and that's one of the kind of interesting paradoxes about self-management as well and, and they, they say it a lot in the An Everyone Culture book that um, it's painful sometimes, it's hard work, it's not easy um, but the trade-off is that it's incredibly rewarding and fulfilling and you and you learn so much uh, that it kind of makes makes it worth it in the end. So worth it in the end, you asked me a question about the transition to CEO and I told you the hard bits, the good bit is I feel utterly liberated. I feel joyful in a different way that, that than I did and I loved my job before and it's a bit like not knowing you could possibly be even more joyful but it's given me a different headspace around development and ideas um, and that's that's why well-being teams exist now is because I gained that freedom by giving up being a CEO and I wouldn't go back for the world. Something that I want to talk about as well is these these well-being teams that you're setting up I know this is inspired very much by Burtzorg and the, the self-managing neighbourhood nursing teams that they have. So can you say something about these wellbeing teams that you're setting up and what the vision is? Yes, I, I'd be really um, delighted to. And then just say this came because A, I read Credit Value's book and like lots of people got so inspired by Burtzorg. But it was because we moved to self-management and I had experienced it from the inside, as well as then having the headspace to take on a, a quite a significant uh, project that is now utterly um, consuming me in, in a, a great way too. So so learned about Burtzorg and the satisfaction of the people they serve, um, people and patients, is incredibly high. They regularly win their space to work and their back office costs against an industry standard of 25%. Or 8%. So, you know, for the UK health and social care field, that's the holy grail, isn't it? Satisfied staff, satisfied people supported and cheaper. Um, so we equally got very excited about it. And of course, they're operating in a completely different environment. It's um, an insurance based system. They don't have CQC and CQC um, and the regulations demand a registered manager. So how do you fit being a registered manager in this self-management and the whole of the thrust of UK policy and the CARE Act is around outcome-based provision as well. So how do we do that and how do we do that in the context of personal budgets? So and then you know, how do we do it in a way that delivers really amazing choice and control for people directing their own their own service? So, so that's a, a hefty challenge that has uh, occupied me uh, for 18 months now. So I, I spent a while researching it, you know, reading everything I could about Burtzorg, um, talking to people who've done similar things, working with Susan Bassfield around it as well. And also going back to our own work around person-centred teams, around person-centred practices, we've done a lot of work in, in home care too. So persuaded three or four people who eventually tested this out with different teams um, in England so that we could see and, and from practice, almost like in a lean start at minimal viable product way, start learning by doing rather than, than learning by um, imagining what it could look like. Um, and we failed a lot. We learned a lot about what not to do as well as what to do. Um, and part of what we were looking at is the only the only reason this is worth doing is if we could create something that could happen at scale. And I think scale is either about creating an organisation as big as Burtzorg, or it's about exploring different ways of doing it, like social franchising. And initially we thought that social franchising might be the way forward, but I've come much more to believe that actually doing it as an organisation is a more powerful way of making sure the values and the ethos and, and that we go as far as we can. So to get a long story short, I am changing how I work. Um, although HSA is still alive and kicking and doing really well, um, most of my time 
from the end of this month, we'll be setting up a new provider called Wellbeing Teams and becoming the registered manager myself, if CQC accept me, um, so that we can see how far we can go in taking forward wellbeing teams, not just in home care, but across health and social care as well. So they're very similar to um, the Bertsorg model, no more than 12 people, neighbourhood-based, self-managing or self-organising. But so, but so they have one coach, we have two coaches, because we are intentionally welcoming people who have no care experience into um, wellbeing teams, because we think wellbeing teams sit at the intersection of um, compassionate care and customer service um, because that's the sort of ethos that we want to have customer first and empowering people to have as much choice and control as possible so if you're coming to us and you've got experience of care we say welcome you've got some unlearning to do and if you're coming to us with no experience for care so in in our our um, the service that we we're working with in devon um, one of the, the team members kelly she was a head waitress and another team member, Shire, um, he was a kitchen porter. So we welcome people who have no experience of care and say, we'll teach you what you need to learn. So this is new for all of us. There are two coaches. There's a team coach who has the responsibility for supporting self-management and team well-being. We are so serious about the well-being and well-being teams being both for team members and for people we serve. And we use five ways to well-being and lots of different approaches around that. And we have a practice coach and her role is to support team members to get through the care certificate and support them to deliver compassionate care. Because the difference between us and Burtzog is Burtzog are mainly nurses who have a professional qualification and know how to do the job. What's different for them is how they organise themselves. With well-being workers, we're recruiting people who don't have no experience of delivering care. So we need to teach them how to do the job, deliver compassionate care, as well as supporting a different way of organising ourselves. And the other big difference is we have community circles embedded right at the centre. So every team has a community circle connector who works with volunteers and friends and family around the individuals. So we're wrapping around friends, family, community assets around the person seamlessly with paid support as well. Wow, that's just fantastic. I, f I feel really, I just got goosebumps because I think what where my mind went was you read so much nowadays about, um, you know, automation and AI and robots coming to steal all the jobs and stuff like that. And I think something that I've always thought is that there's still such a valuable human role to play in care. Um, and so the fact that you're welcoming people who don't have care experience and coaching them uh, in that in that role and, and sort of seeing it also as customer service and that crossover between customer service and care, I think that's wonderful. Um, and I, I feel like that's just really inspiring for the future in terms of what's possible. Um, yeah, I'm really blown away by that. Thank you. And we want to be the most tech savvy teams in care too. So, so we're going paperless from the word go. All of our team communication is on Slack. Um, we use Zoom for lots of meetings as well. And everybody is issued with um, a smartphone equivalent and all the paperwork is done through an app. And we use something called the support sequence. So, so when we are meeting somebody for the first time, so traditional home care organisations would then call that an assessment. We call it an initial conversation. What we want to do is figure out with the person what their priorities are, what matters to them, what their priorities for change are, and, and to use the language of the Care Act, that will be their outcomes, and then design the service together. So we start with what in health and social care is called self-care, but what it really means is how can we support you to be as confident as possible in either managing or long-term condition or living at home and let, let's think about that we never use this term self-care directly with people but then we look at assistive technology but our understanding of assistive technology is all things digital so one possibility might be um, that if if the, the, the person um, lives a long way away from from a son or daughter so say you live in Devon and your son lives in 
Scotland. So we might be looking at ways that if we're um, supporting you to have an evening meal on a, on a Sunday night, for example, what we would like to figure out together with you is how do we, is setting up a Zoom call or a Skype call with your son while we figure out the food and make dinner for you. So in the same kind of a time that would usually be allocated, you can be spending 20 minutes chatting to your son once a week or once a fortnight or whatever works for both of you and getting the meal that, that's part of, of, of the service that we're there to provide. So we're thinking about tech in terms of relationships and community and families staying in touch with each other through WhatsApp group and things like that, not just the traditional ways that we think about tech in terms of monitoring safety and safety alarms. So we do self-care, we do tech, we do friends, family and community through community circles. And then we look at paid support. So we think we shouldn't be providing paid support if tech can do the job for you, because we want to make your hours, your money, go as far as possible and get as much for it as possible. And then you choose your own team. Now, choosing your own team is unheard of in home care, but we genuinely have ways where you choose out of the 12 team members, the three or four that you want to support you through one page profiles and through mini introduction films as well. So it's a my job. So the, the whole team is supported by what we call a wellbeing support team, which is the two coaches, the community circle connector and me. Our job is to create the environment that enable the well-being teams to flourish. So we sit underneath and around the team rather than at the top in a very traditional hierarchical way. And currently you have six teams and the vision is to have 600, is that right? 600. So we're about to recruit our six teams. So we, we've worked with four different teams um, that have been um, helping us test and learn. But we haven't been using practice coaches in the other teams. And that's part of what we've learned we really need to have in place. So the full model with practice coaches will be starting in Wigan um, and we go to recruitment um, in the next next six weeks and we're learning and, and building on our recruitment process it's a value-based recruitment process which we've already won awards for which we're utterly delighted for but we know that the recruitment is the critical almost do or die about whether this can work or not can we get the right people we're really hopeful that we can we start recruiting um, very very soon and getting the teams in place as soon as possible we're starting with six in Wigan but our ambition has to be scale so our question is how do we go from six to six hundred in under three years and what are your thoughts so far on that do you have any early um ideas well um lisa this is the scariest and most ambitious thing i've ever i've ever done particularly personally taking the role of, of registered um, manager um so i know we're about to go on a huge learning curve and somebody said to me well what if it fails and i said this can't fail because we have to be Emerson. We have to go failure, 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 failure. Every failure is learning. Every failure is us getting better. Every failure is, a, is another thing to, to test and learn. So, so taking everybody with us on that journey is going to be powerful, scary, incredible, but the biggest learning journey I'm, I'm sure I've ever been on. If we are successful, so one of the other differences is um, we are creating a career path for people, which is, again, not typically present in home care. And people have weekly team meetings, which doesn't happen in home care, feel part of teams, which doesn't happen in home care, and have 20% of their time off rota to fulfill their roles and be part of team meetings and to meet with their buddy once um, a month. So what I'm hoping that if anything is possible, if we can create a different experience for our colleagues um, and that's, that we do that well, other people will want to join us. So my hope is in the same way that Birdsaw gets probably about 100 CVs every week of people asking to, to join them, that we grow and spread by word of mouth. So that, that's the ultimate um, that I'm hoping that if we're successful, other people want to come and work with us and that we'll grow organically that way. And we'll invite other wellbeing leaders to come and, and do the role that, that I'm doing as well. And my win of the week, which uh, has happened um, today, is I've been speaking to senior people in CQC who are responsible for looking at new models and, and regulation. And, and they're 
feedback to me is that they're enthusiastic about this, that they can see that wellbeing teams are a new model of care and figuring out how self-managed teams can demonstrate well-led for CQC and can ultimately be rated as, as outstanding if they demonstrate that well. Now, that feels like a huge step forward too, not just for us, but for self-management as a way of delivering health and social care within our, our regulated framework. I mean, this is a this is, as you said, a big a big undertaking. It's going to be a huge learning curve, um, and in the same way that Yosta Block is sort of the source of Puets Org and holding the space for that, you're the source for these well-being teams. What what motivates you personally? Why is this so important to you? I'm just taking a breath. The honest answer to that is that um, I was 50 two years ago and, and my dad, I hope you're good at editing. <laughs> <laughs> is it okay that I ask this? No, <laughs> Please don't feel like you have to answer. No, it's really, really important. So I was 52 years ago. My dad died when he was 53. And um, I think you never know. You don't know how long you've got left. And, um, and I think getting to 50 made me think about that in, in a new way. So... So I, I said that I read the book um, Reinventing Organisations, and that was really powerful. I, I also read Atal Gandhi's Being Mortal at the same time, and um, and it made me think if I if I could change anything, if I could contribute to any change, you know, I think our biggest need is is how we see older people, how we think about older age, how we treat each other as we get older, and how we die well. So as I kind of um, ask myself, if, if I only had three years, do, do I want to spend the next three years doing what I'm doing now as a, as a trainer and consultant? And I hope I have made some difference in the work that I've done. But I wanted to be bolder. I wanted to see if I could go further. And I think that's part of the ethos behind Alt MBA is you know, how how brave could I be? So, so this is an evolution, I think, of me deciding that um, I think consultancy, I think some consultants, and I hope we did and do, make, make a big difference. But there's something very different about messing with other people's projects as a consultant and, and working with them and taking them. And that, that's a phrase a bit more disrespectfully than, than, I, than I mean, but that you can never... You are, there are always boundaries to how far you can make change as a consultant because it's not your business and it's not your organization and it's not your finance that you're risking and it's not your reputation as an organization that you're risking. So, so I think that I can only test out these ideas as far as possible if I'm personally taking responsibility for the money, you know, the reputation, the registration with CQC and all of that. Um, so... So that's why it's because I want to be as bold as I can and I want to see how far we can go with this. And I don't want to assume that I've got 30 more years of work or 20 more years of work. I want to behave as if, if this was the last contribution I could make, it's this. 